paper, uh, Chen, the first paper, Chen Si Zhu, will uh, talk on short pairing free blind signatures with exponential security. Hello. Um, yeah. So, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm a PhD student from University of Washington, and this is a joint work with my advisor, Stefano Tassaro. So in a context of line signatures, we have a signer with secret key and a user with public key. And the user wants to sign a message M by running an interactive protocol with a uh, signer. And at the end, the user will learn a valid signature from M, uh, which can be verified using the public key. And on the other side, we require the signer to be blind, which means the signer does not know the message during the interaction. And moreover, uh, even given the message and signature later, a signer cannot link them back to which session that issues them. My signatures have a number of well-known applications. For example, it can be used in anonymous eCash systems or within anonymous credentials. And more recently, they have gained popularities due to their ability to implement uh, anonymous tokens in web applications, for example, for privacy preserving ad click measurement. The current practically efficient schemes fall into uh, the following three classes uh, RSA based schemes, SNOR style schemes, and the parent based schemes. Uh, SNOR style schemes require three rounds for each signing where the RSA-based and parent-based schemes require only two rounds. However, both RSA and parent-based schemes have some drawbacks. So the main drawbacks of the parent-based schemes is that they require parent-friendly elliptic curves, which make them undesirable for many applications um, due to the lack of high assurance implementation, for example, in the internet browser. On the other side, um, the RSA blind signatures inherit all undesirable properties of RSAs, like the large key size. So therefore, many applications might prefer using the SNOR style schemes, to, despite their higher round complexity, in particular because they are simple to implement, allowed efficient verification, and also can be based on any standard elliptic curves. However, very recently, uh, Buhamuda et uh, al. shows a polynomial time attack against the most efficient snore style scheme by solving the so-called ROS problem efficiently. So therefore, a big problem we address in this paper is that can we have a secure snore style scheme, which is also very efficient? Of course, we are not the first to ask this question. So let me tell you a little more about related works and how our results are substantial improvement over the state of the art. So the original blind snore uh, was proposed by Charles Patterson in 1993. It's the most efficient. The signature size is uh, just two scalar and the communication complexity is one group elements plus two scalar. However, as I mentioned, um, uh, the scheme is actually broken. So an alternative is a scheme proposed by Abed in 2001. However, the scheme is less efficient and its original security proof was found to be, uh, to be incorrect. But a recent result by Kastner shows its, its security uh, in the algebraic group model and the random oracle model. At this point, I'd like to point out that all the results I showed in this page um, assume this to ideal model. A more efficient scheme was proposed by Fuchsbauer in 19, sorry, in 2020, which is a so-called Klaus blind snore. Uh, the signature size is exactly the same as the blind snore with a double communication. However, its security relies on a, a new assumption, namely the so-called MRS problem is hard, where MRS is a variant of RS proposed in their paper. The important point here is that there, there exists a substantial attack against MLS, uh, which requires to choose a large uh, curve to achieve desirable security level. So as you can see, the existing schemes are either less efficient or do not have the best possible security guarantees. So therefore, uh, the major contribution of this paper uh, is we propose two schemes that are both efficient and have exponential security. So our first scheme, the signature size is just three scalar and the communication complexity is two group elements plus three scalar. 
and then we prove its security in the uh, in a generic group model. And for our second scheme, we can prove its security in the algebraic group model, assuming all needed discrete logarithm is hard, in addition to a random oracle. However, we need to add an additional scalar to both signature size and communication. Very appealing uh, feature of this second scheme is that it emits a partially blind version, where partially blind means uh, it allows a part of message to be known by the signer. So as you can see, um, our scheme was uh, the most efficient parent-free scheme so far with exponential security. And before we move on, um, I would like to mention a few more uh, related works to give you a full picture of the area. So first of all, there were uh, security analysis for snow style schemes in some restricted setting. For example, uh, some of them can be proved secure when the number of sessions is small or when these sessions are sequential. And this work, however, we targeted a more realistic setting where these sessions are concurrent and their number is unbounded. Um, interestingly, some of the work I listed here do not uh, rely on the AGM or GGM. Another interesting line of work explores boosting techniques, um, which uh, the goal is to transform uh, a scheme that is secure only for a small number of signings into a scheme that is secure for an unbounded number of signings. However, one drawback of the resulting schemes is that their communication and computation complexities grow with the number of sessions. So I've now come to a technical part of the talk. So um, for, um, for security definition, I will not uh, define the blindness formally. We rely on an intuitive understanding. So in this talk, I will mo uh, mostly discuss how to achieve unforgeability. However, unlike the fungibility for the normal signature scheme, which is defined as the adversary cannot forge a signature that is not being issued by a signer. Here, as you can see for blind signature, it is unclear which signature actually is been issued during the uh, signing process. Therefore, we need to use another notion called uh, one more unforgibility. So in a security game, the adversary can interact with um, uh, signer for L sessions. And the goal, uh, so it was wins if it can output L plus one valid message and signature pairs. So here, all the sessions can be arbitrarily concurrent. In other words, one more forgeability means the adversary cannot forge a number of signature, which is more than the number of sending sessions. So the overview of the my talk is as follows. So to give you some intuition about our constructions, I will first record what, um, the, uh, what blind snor signatures are and show their relation with the ROS problem. In particular, I will show how one can break the one more fungibility of blind snor by solving the corresponding ROS problem. And since the ROS problem is solvable in polynomial time, this gives a polynomial time attack against um, a blind snor. And next, I will show our idea to avoid the ROS attack that underlies our schemes. By, under some assumptions, we can show the security of our scheme uh, is equivalent to solving the WFRS problem, uh, which is a problem we define in our paper. And in contrast to ROS problem, we can actually show WFRS is exponentially hard, which is, implies the exponential security of our scheme. In particular, I will define uh, what is uh, WFRS and um, provide some intuition behind its hardness. So to start with, I will first describe the non-blind version of, of blind Schnorr signatures. So the public parameter consists of um, group G with size P and a generator little g and a hash function H. The, uh, the secret key is a group element, uh, sorry, it's a scalar randomly sampled from ZP and the corresponding public key is G to the X. And during the signing, the signer first sample a random nouns A uniformly from ZP and send the G rise to A to the user. And then the user compute the challenge C as the hash of A and M. And after receiving the a challenge from the user, the signer computes an S as A plus C times X. And then the final signature is just C and S. And to verify a signature, one can recover the A from C and S, 
and then check whether the C is consistent with the hash value. It is easy to get a perfect blind version of it by adding two random masks as highlighted. So therefore, uh, we're now looking to the one more possibility of the scheme. So where the user becomes the adversary, so we only need to consider the signers protocol here. So I will now describe how one can break the one more fungibility of blind snore by solving the corresponding RS problem. So consider an adversary uh, that uh, starts two concurrent signing sessions. So here I use subscript one to know the first signing sessions and the subscript two to know the second. So firstly, I will show how we can generate a signature, which is a linear combination of two sessions. And then we'll show how we can extend it to an attack where the adversary can output three distinct and valid messenger signature pairs. And then we'll see where the ROS problems appears. The so first of all, to combine two sessions, the adversary can pick two arbitrary coefficient alpha one, alpha two, together with the message M. And now the adversary said A should be A1 to alpha one times A2 to the alpha two and set C to be the hash of A and the message. And then the adversary can pick C1 and C2 such that the value C is a linear combination of C1 and C2 with coefficient alpha. And after the adversary received the CS1 and S2 from uh, the signer, the adversary now set S to also be a linear combination of S1 and S2 with coefficient alpha. And now we'll show that then the CS is a valid signature for, for the message. To see why this is the case, we can see from the signing, pro, uh, signing protocol, we can get these two equations. And then we can linearly combine this equation with coefficient alpha. And now let's write G to the value on both sides of the equation. So from the left-hand side, we get G to the S. And from the first two terms of the, um, the right-hand side, we get uh, basically give, give you A. And from the last term, it gives you the x to the c. So this is exactly what we need to show the signature is valid. So now to extend it to an attack, the idea is that instead of picking just one triple of r one, r two, and the message, we now pick three of them, and then we pick c one and c two such that the highlighted equation uh, hold uh, for all of them, and then the adversary can output a signature for each triple. So as you can see, the main, like the main problem here to make this attack work is how to pick this alpha and how to pick the C1 and C2. And this is exactly the RS problem for parameter two. However, the RS problem is still hard for, uh, for two, but we can extend this attack to L sessions easily. And Buchemoto et al. shows that when L is larger than log P, um, the RS problem is efficiently solvable. So therefore, it means um, the blind snore is insecure when L is larger than log P. So I will now come to our schemes. So um, remember that the key step of doing the RS attack against blind snore is that we can uh, generate a signature, which is a linear combination of two sessions. So therefore, our idea to avoid it, we just simply add a y to this equation. So suppose the y1 and y2 are chosen randomly and hidden to the adversary before picking c1 and c2. We find it is not possible anymore to combine uh, two sessions to get a signature. So basically, uh, we don't know how to pick the y's here to make the equation hold. So I will now uh, describe how we construct our first scheme with this idea. Uh, for simplicity, I will only give a non-blind version here. Uh, we can get a perfect blind version of it uh, easily uh, following some common tricks. So uh, for our scheme, the parameters, uh, public parameter settings and uh, the key generation are exactly the same as blind snore. And for doing the signing, the signer will additionally sample the Y, which is a non-zero uniformly from ZP, and send the X, the public key, writes the Y to the user. And now to compute the challenge, the hash function will also take the Y as input. 
And then uh, the sign will set S to be A plus C times Y times X. And then the final signature now is CS and Y. And to verify it, um, we, we just reject if Y is equal to zero, and otherwise we can recover the A and Y from, from the CS and little y, and then check whether the hash is consistent with the C value. So one thing to notice here is that um, we do not allow Y to be zero because it is easy to forge a signature for Y to be zero. For our second scheme, the only difference is that we change the big Y to be a Patterson commitment of little y, where the Z is a part of the public key. So um, because the commitment uh, Y now is perfectly high as the value of little y, we can relax the assumption from GGM to AGM plus this log assumption. And also to get a partially blind version, we just need to change uh, the Z to be a hash of info for each signing, where the info represents the part of the message that is known to the signer. And due to the time limit, I will uh, only show the main theorem we get for scheme one. Um, so formally for any GGM anniversary, the probability to break one more forgeability of scheme one is bounded by the probability of solving the corresponding WFRS problem plus an extra term. Or here, the QH represents the number of um, uh, has, uh, queries to the hash function H, and L represents the number of signing sessions, and Q5 represents the number of group operations performed by the adversary. Um, so for polynomial time adversary, we can see the, uh, the extra term was actually negligible. So therefore, our scheme one is secure as long as the WFLS problem is hard. So for the hardness of WFLS, we can show that for any adversary, the probability of solving WFLS is bounded by QH times QH plus 2L over P minus one. So we'll uh, note that P is the original group order. So therefore, for an adversary to break uh, to solve WFLS, either the QH or L have to be roughly the uh, scale of square root of P, which implies the exponential security of our scheme. So finally, I would like to convey some ideas behind how we define WFLS and um, why it is hard. So recall that the our main intuition was that in our construction. It's not possible to combine um, two linear, uh, two sessions linearly to get a signature. However, actually, there are other ways that one can combine two sessions. Uh, for example, a trivial way is that we can set both C1 and C2 to just be the C. And then we can find we can linearly combine these two equations and get a signature. But however, this does not help at all to break the security. Because if you're thinking about it, what you're doing is just getting one signature from two signing sessions, and then both sessions cannot be used for generating other signatures. So basically this action does not help. But um, however, it is unclear whether the adversary can do some other arbitrary things, other combinations. So we define this following WFRS problem to capture all possible ways the adversary can combine different sessions to get a new signature. But due to the time limit, I will not go into details here. But um, the main reason why WFS is hard is because essentially the only way that the adversary can break, sorry, can combine different sessions is the trivial way I showed in the previous slide. And this is mainly because we have sample random Y here. So by the end, I would like to mention a few open problems. So, First of all, um, all of our results are, assume either the AGM or GGM. So a big open problem is whether we can get um, Schnorr style schemes with exponential security, assuming only the random oracles. Also, it's interesting to know whether there are other applications for WFLS. So yeah, that's all my, uh, my talk. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you so much. Uh, do we have any questions for the speaker? Uh, 
perhaps uh, I can ask, uh, so intuitively, why do you need algebraic group model and not not standard model? Uh, um, where do you get this, this necessity of it in your construction? Yeah, actually, so yeah, so the main reason like we need the algebraic group model is because we need to extract basically what the adversary do. Um, so basically we extract the uh, alpha and beta. So basically that represents what the adversary do to combine different sessions. So our main argument is that if they do something like that, then the adversary cannot break the scheme. But if you're in a standard model, you have no idea what the adversary do. Although it might not be able to do something more, but like we just don't have formal argument to argue that. Okay, this makes sense. Uh, yeah, thank thank you. you so much. Yeah, thank you. If there is no further questions, then uh, let's thank the speaker again.